joining us today for this webcast, an update on the energy industry in Appalachia. I am Colin Powell, ACG board director, and my day job is the CEO of Pinnacle Accounting and Finance. Pinnacle Accounting and Finance provides interim or temporary finance and accounting people to companies uh, and also serve as traditional headhunters for roles ranging from CFOs to senior accountants and senior analysts. Uh, for 2021, we've talked to our market people and it looks like our motto to be released in 2021 is we build careers, teams, and cultures, which is much better than our 2020 slogan, which is please, please let me out of 2020. So that's, that's my little Zoom joke. That's my Zoom joke for the day. Uh, first, I'd like to thank uh, the ACG Pittsburgh annual sponsors. We would not be here today without their gener generosity and especially at this time when things are uncertain, we are very grateful. Uh, if you're interested in becoming a sponsor, please let me know or reach out to Micah Whitfield. Since our sponsors have been so good to us this year, we have decided to offer free attendance uh, for uh, regular virtual programming. Your sponsorship also includes a free membership to ACG Pittsburgh for an individual under the age of 40. Now moving on to today's event, Charlie Schliebs, Managing Director of Stone Pier Capital Advisors, and Steve Schlotterbeck, Managing Partner from Peerless Energy Partners, will lead our discussion. As a reminder, if the audience has any questions for our panel during the presentation, please use the Q&A feature within the Zoom window to ask. Our panelists will look to answer as many of your questions as possible. So now I'll, I'll, I'll kick it over to Charlie and Steve to elaborate on their bios and begin the program. Charlie, Steve. Hey, great, Colin. Thank you so much. It's great to uh, see everybody here today. Um, uh, Steve and I are pleased to uh, uh, provide a little update on what's going on in the energy space, especially oil and gas and petrochemical here in the region. Um, and, uh, uh, and then if we have a little time, we can talk about other uh, things going on in energy other than oil and gas. So uh, my background, a little different than uh, a lot of folks in the energy space. I got into it very serendipitous, serendipitously in uh, uh, 2008 when, um, when I was asked uh, early in the development here of the Marcellus to uh, consult for uh, Chesapeake Energy. And uh, got trained down in Oklahoma City and learned uh, a lot about the business. Uh, not anything like uh, Steve who spent his entire career uh, actually doing it, but I learned uh, a fair amount and got involved in it and then uh, couldn't really walk away from it because it was such an exciting uh, area for our region and its uh, development. Um, and I, at, at Stone Pier, while we um, do many other things besides energy, Energy is, is one of our favorite areas, and we, we tend to do uh, a pretty large amount in it, uh, especially when things are a little stronger than they might be right now. So, uh, uh, Steve, why don't you uh, give, a little, give a little of your background that's relevant to our audience? Sure. Thanks, Charlie, and uh, thanks to ACG and all the participants for the opportunity to, uh, to speak to you today. So, as Charlie said, I spent my, my whole uh, adult career in the oil and gas business. I uh, spent about 32 years in, in the US oil and gas business. The early part of my career was as an engineer working in the Gulf of Mexico and in the Cook Inlet of Alaska for Marathon Oil Company. And then the last 18 years of my career, I spent at, at EQT Corp here in Pittsburgh, where I helped transform the company from a local gas utility, producing about 200 million cubic feet a day to the largest gas producer in the country producing over four BCF a day, uh, which is about a 20 fold increase over that 18 years. And frankly, the bulk of that increase came over the past decade with the, with the shale revolution. Uh, and my last few there, years there were spent as president and then finally as president and CEO of EQT Corp. Uh, in 2018, I decided to retire and now I do a little bit of consulting work for Stone Pier and I also serve as the chairman of the board for Reveal Energy Services, which is a Houston-based supplier of frac diagnostic technology and completion data management software. And I should note, since uh, in the intro, uh, Colin mentioned uh, 
uh, Peerless Energy Partners. Uh, that was a venture Ben Holbert and I, the, the former founder and CEO of Eclipse and, and uh, Rex Energy uh, put together earlier this year uh, with the intent to acquire some distressed producing properties. Uh, ben and I recently decided to, to dissolve Peerless as it looks like uh, we missed the window uh, for the assets we were, we were interested in, which is frankly probably good news in terms of uh, where the industry's headed. And I'll, I'll uh, spend a little more time talking about that uh, in a minute. Thanks, Steve. What we're gonna do is uh, we're gonna uh, have a discussion about uh, the EMP companies. We'll have a discussion about the oil field services, services companies uh, then some on midstream, um, and then we'll move into um, some important things in, in this region uh, relating to uh, gas storage, or particularly ethane storage, and the petrochemical industry and its position currently and where it's going. So for our audience that's interested in mergers and acquisitions, um, uh, obviously you're not going to be buying or selling Shell or or something like that. But there are all sorts of companies that uh, are involved in, in servicing uh, these industries that, um, uh, that are, are really ripe for, for work, uh, regardless of, of your functionality, whether you're um, a boutique M&A shop like Stone Pier, or whether you're um, uh, an, an accountant or a law firm, or many, many other kinds of professional service providers. So Steve, you wanna kick it off and talk about um, uh, the situation in the EMP side? Sure, happy to. Um, so uh, uh, Charlie had asked me to address uh, EMP and a bit of, of midstream. And as I thought about that, I thought there were maybe three specific areas uh, that I'd try and comment on. So the first is, an update on the current supply demand situation uh, with US gas, uh, some comments on the consolidation and M&A activity we've seen across the space, including the Northeast, uh, and the potential impacts of the Biden administration and what that might mean for US oil and gas, and particularly uh, uh, Northeast gas. So, so first, uh, an update on the, on the current state of the industry. Uh, some of you may recall that in June 2019, I gave a presentation at the Northeast Petrochemical Conference where I predicted a period of intense pain for the U.S. gas business. That prediction was predicated on the fact that the U.S. gas supply and demand situation was severely out of balance and the producers weren't taking the appropriate measures to address the situation. Oh, hold on a second. I lost you. Okay. Okay. Unfortunately, my predictions were correct, and we've seen 18 months of layoffs, reduced investment, and a significant amount of bankruptcies in the industry. In fact, in the past 18 months, there's, there's been 81 U.S. producers filed for bankruptcy, including the very well-known Chesapeake Energy, who had a whopping $11 billion in debt. And also just this week, we saw Gulfport Energy, a big producer in the Ohio Utica, file for Chapter 11. A lot has changed in the past 18 months, and I'm moderately bullish that we are seeing systemic changes in the industry business model that could yield a more bullish out, out, long-term outlook. In June 2019, uh, there were 967 rigs running in the US, 789 drilling for oil and 177 drilling for gas. 75 of those 177 were drilling in the Northeast in the Marcellus Utica area. Today, there are only 312 rigs running, 236 drilling for oil, 73 drilling for gas, and only 31 in the Marcellus Utica. And these numbers are up a, up a bit from the multi-decade low of 244 total rigs running uh, just in August of this year. So we've seen a nearly 68% reduction in total rig activity and almost a 60% reduction in the Marcellus Utica. This has had a dramatic impact on supply. 18 months ago, the EIA natural gas storage report was indicating an excess supply of around 10 BCF per day. Today, it's implying around a five BCF per day shortfall. And that is at current demand levels, which have obviously been impacted by COVID-19, as well as reduced LNG exports as a result of the global economic slowdown also due to COVID-19. 
even with the fairly large demand destruction from COVID, we've seen NYMEX gas prices rise from around $2 per MMBTU in February of this year, prior to COVID-19 impacts, to around $3 per MMBTU today. That's an impressive 50% increase in spite of the demand destruction from COVID. This happened even with collapse in the LNG export market from 8 BCF a day in early 2020 to 3 BCF a day in July 2020. And I think this further illustrates the power that lower supply has on the commodity market. So what does this mean? To me, it means that managing new drilling activity to be in sync with demand is the best and frankly, the only way for the US oil and gas industry to generate shareholder value. Once normal economic activity returns, which hopefully is in sight now with the potential vaccine becoming available, I believe there's significant short-term upside for the US oil and gas industry. The key to extending this upside to the medium and long-term is for the producers to demonstrate prudence and to rethink their capital allocation priorities as free cash flow begins to rise. For now, the producers seem to get it. Most of the larger producers are signaling flat production in 2021. This is great news for the long-term health and survival of the industry as a tight supply demand balance is the only way to generate shareholder returns. While some thought I was crazy 18 months ago, it's interesting to note that since the COVID crisis began in mid-March, supply is down, demand is down, but equity values have skyrocketed with EQT up 100%, range up 200%, and Antero up 300%. So I believe that investors are beginning to understand that the days of high growth for the US oil and gas industry is over and that this will now be a value investment in the future. Although I'm not positive about that. Just this week, an investor note from Truist Securities, which is formerly SunTrust, quote, while we believe capital discipline and low leverage are key, we are not fans of the recent EMP playbook that focuses almost exclusively on shareholder returns and bypasses growth as we believe this will ultimately hurt long-term enterprise value. I frankly strongly disagree with that opinion and wonder what, what world they've been living in. Focusing on growth rates higher than demand growth rates has proved to be disastrous for long-term shareholder value. As I'll discuss in a minute, based on the recent election outcome, I believe it's likely that the days of high demand growth are behind us. Which leads me to my next topic, M&A and what we might see over the next few years. If the industry is to be successful with this new model, a few things will likely need to happen to ensure its success. First, producers must strengthen their balance sheets and operate with significantly less leverage than they have in the past. Second, they must focus relentlessly on lowering their unit costs and do it in a way that builds a competitive advantage. And third, they must adopt much more conservative capital allocation methodologies, favoring return of cash to shareholders over reinvestment in production growth. One of the best paths to accomplishing all of these objectives is for a significant amount of consolidation to occur. We've recently begun to see this start. There's been a number of acquisitions and mergers take place and these are happening at reasonable valuations and with low to no premiums for the public company transactions. This is very good news. Across the US, we're starting to see low premium mergers and acquisitions amongst com companies with proximal assets. For example, we've seen Devon acquire WPX, Chevron acquire Noble, and ConocoPhillips acquire Concho Resources, all in low premium deals where there was extensive acreage synergies. In the Northeast, we've seen National Fuel acquire Shell's Appalachian assets, Southwestern merge with Montage in a low premium deal, and EQT has acquired Chevron's Appalachian assets at a fair price and has indicated that they desire to do more acquisitions. These are very different types of acquisitions from some of the previous disastrous deals. For example, Range acquiring Memorial or Gulfport acquiring Vitruvius, both of which brought no acreage, of op um, brought no acreage synergies and very few, if any, overhead synergies. Successful mergers must consolidate a core position, not just be done to gain scale or to diversify. Those types of mergers simply don't work. So why do I think consolidation is necessary? Well, several reasons. First, consolidation leads to lower unit overhead costs. The larger producers have a significant cost advantage over smaller producers when it comes to unit G&A costs. 
especially when looking at the public companies. Smart consolidation where the focus is on marrying up properties that fit well together also drives significant operational synergies. For example, allowing for longer laterals, which are more profitable than shorter laterals, improving water logistics, allowing more efficient use of long haul pipeline capacity and allowing for more efficient gathering systems to be built. These are all very real benefits of consolidation that cannot be achieved any other way. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, it allows for a smaller number of larger operators to implement more prudent capital allocation and should make it easier for the industry to keep supply in balance with demand. As I hinted at earlier, I believe the days of explosive demand growth may be behind us, but a more stable, profitable future is on the horizon. Unfortunately, just as the industry is getting back on its feet, it now faces significant headwinds that threaten its future survival. And that's through a Biden-Harris administration. So a few ways that uh, the new administration could, could hamstring our industry. Uh, first, we've heard, you've heard a lot of talk about fracking and, and frack bans, and those are certainly possible. I think most likely uh, we'll see uh, an attempt to ban fracking on federal land. I will tell you that that really would not hurt the Northeast very much. We, we have really no federal land in play. And for most of the US would be uh, minimally impacted with the exception of New Mexico and perhaps the Gulf of Mexico, which is all federal land. But many of the, the Gulf of Mexico fields can be developed without fracking. So I think that would be a fairly minor impact to the, to the industry overall, perhaps even a bit bullish for the Northeast. If it, if it ended up with a little less supply coming from associated gas, uh, particularly out of New Mexico. I think there are far more uh, important ways that, that a new administration could impact uh, our industry. And one is, uh, I think he's likely to point heads of the EPA, Interior and Labor, which includes OSHA and, and, and regulations around organized labor, who could be very anti oil and gas and increased regulatory burdens could have a significant impact on the ability of the, the industry to grow or even to maintain uh, its current level. It's likely that they will require agencies to consider climate change impacts for federal permitting. This will primarily affect interstate pipelines, which are already struggling to get the myriad of federal permits necessary. Uh, but certainly there are ways it could make it uh, even more difficult to, to get the necessary permits. Um, additional regulatory burdens are likely uh, to cause significant impact on the cost and speed of future development. And some of the biggest impacts, as I said, will be on the infrastructure. Uh, either further delays or the inability to permit interstate pipelines, LNG export facilities, or petrochemical facilities could have significant negative effects on the industry. And, and a final way that the new administration could, could, could have a negative impact on the industry is through tax law changes, particularly the el elimination of the intangible drilling cost deduction. Well, this is a deduction that the oil and gas industries enjoyed for over a hundred years. Uh, it was developed to uh, incent the exploration for oil and gas. The Obama administration uh, for eight years um, talked about trying to eliminate this deduction. I think under the Biden-Harris administration, there will be further attempts to do it. And it, it's a real impact, both through, through the lowering of the returns of future investments because of the higher tax burden, but probably more importantly, through the reduced cash flow available uh, to companies to reinvest in maintaining or hopefully slowly growing production. Um, I think in the short term, uh, the elimination of the IDC deduction is unlikely, especially if the Republicans maintain control of the Senate. If they lose control, then I think the Senate will likely attempt to, to eliminate the deduction, but I think that the ace in the hole uh, for the industry is likely uh, Senator Joe Manchin in West Virginia, who in my opinion is unlikely uh, to support uh, something like that. And I think he's also likely to be a roadblock for many of the most radical ideas of the progressive left, especially concerning uh, the fossil fuel industries. And I think fi finally, Biden has been very clear that not only will he target the supply side of the, of the equation, he intends to target uh, the demand side as well. 
So on demand, he may limit or restrict the ability to build new gas fire generation, may limit new building construction from having natural gas service. And with climate change as one of his top priorities and the US oil and gas industry at the top of the hit list, it'll become much more difficult to grow US demand. I expect global demand to continue to increase, which would certainly mitigate the effects of the demand destruction we'll likely see from a new administration. But that only helps if the pipelines to the export facilities and the export facilities themselves can get built. So while I'm more bullish now than I was 18 months ago, I don't believe the industry will return to the boom days of several years ago. The correct business model precludes rapid growth and the political direction of the country seems to be leading to a slow but constant shift away from fossil fuels, leading to reduced demand growth and then to sh uh, shrinking demand. We will have an oil and gas industry for the next 50 years, but it will look a lot different from what we've become accustomed to over the past decade. With that, I'll turn it over to Charlie. Let me ask you a couple of questions. Uh, sure. I was taking a few notes. Um, you remember Nigel Hearn, who was CEO of Chevron Appalachia for a number of years. Uh, and I know you knew him. Uh, Nigel said to me when he uh, first moved here, when Bruce Niemeyer um, uh, moved on to Texas, uh, Nigel said, and this would have been 2012, 13, he said that uh, within 10 years, our producers left in the Marcellus Utica. Are, is, is that consolidation that we're seeing now heading towards uh, that kind of result that Nigel predicted? What are, what are your thoughts? I think so. Um, I, I mean, I don't know. I'd hate to predict specific numbers over specific time frames, but I absolutely think it's, it's a necessity that that kind of consolidation happens. And I think one thing we're seeing uh, and this is based on some of the feedback we got when Ben and I were uh, out in the financial markets uh, trying to, to stand up peerless. I think the, the private equity firms, I'm not sure they quite have gotten it yet. I think they're still hopeful that they can repeat um, some of the strategies they've used in the past, but I think it's starting to sink into them that, it, that they're not going to be able to achieve you know, the 20 to 30% IRR targets uh, that they were accustomed to. And I think as a result, many of them are going to start looking elsewhere uh, for their investment opportunity. Now, some of them are, are very energy focused, some are very oil and gas focused, so they're probably not going away. But I think you're going to see less capital influx from the private equity markets. Um, and I think that's that will sort of facilitate this consolidation push amongst the, the large public companies that, that, are, that are out there now. So I, I do believe that that's where this is all headed. That's, that's, a, good, that's a good point. Uh, you know, not every prediction from those guys uh, is, is correct, but uh, that one may, may, be, uh, uh, may be right on. Um, I'd like your thoughts about the local Pennsylvania price volatility that that we've been seeing recently, you know, as you know, as most people know, you, you've got the Henry Hub and the NYMEX, which are more of a national kind of a focus. Um, but we have all these mini hubs uh, around uh, Pennsylvania and they have dramatically different pricing that, with a differential that can be quite significant compared to Henry Hub or, or NYMEX futures. And recently that volatility has been crazy. I mean, uh, far more volatility than has been seen in the in the hub, Henry Hub or, or, or IMEX. Um, and it's, it's just gone up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. What what are you reading uh, from that? It seems like just the slightest hint of some colder weather just can send it up like by a multiple of five. Yeah, I think that's, that's a great question, Charlie. And I think... Uh... Northeast basis is, is notoriously highly volatile. And it, it, it's so dependent on a, a tight balance in supply and demand. And, and that, it's funny because, you know, we've, I've talked about this in the past, but the whole market's flipped upside down from where it was 20 years ago, where Appalachia was, was close to the demand markets. Now Appalachia is at the, at the tail end of the system from the demand markets. 
which are all on the Gulf Coast, not all on the Gulf Coast, but the, but the big ones are. And over this summer, we saw a major pipeline explosion on a Tetco pipe that takes gas to the Gulf. So Northeast gas uh, was restricted from getting to the Gulf. Um, that contributed to a, a pretty big decline in the Northeast basis. Uh, and the effects of, of COVID-19 and the dramatic reduction in LNG exports. So less gas was leaving the Gulf Coast uh, for the rest of the world. And again, we're at the back end of that. We have the hardest time accessing that. So when they, when they need less gas, that, that flows back through the basis numbers to, to uh, disincentivize production from the Northeast. So I think you had those two factors happening. And, and you're right, it's been all over the board, but right now, I think it's still Northeast basis is still north of a dollar. So $3 NYMEX, uh, if you're selling on Dominion South, for example, I think right now you're getting below $2 for your gas. So that's a problem. Although I do think uh, one thing to keep in mind, the new pipeline, so the MVP is probably the, you know, the, the biggest one now since ACP was canceled, uh, but that's going to have a tariff of 80 cents. And you're going to pay 80 cents to get something close to a NYMEX price. So on the margin, a Northeast basis, uh, certainly for incremental gas, is going to be minus 80 cents from NYMEX. That's just the world that Appalachia lives in now, unfortunately. Maybe that's a good segue to, to spend a little time on, uh, on midstream. Because um, I know, you know, when you were at EQT, you not only were CEO of the of the uh, uh, parent company, but also CEO of, of their midstream operations. So can you give us a little update on, on that part? Yeah, so uh, I think primarily uh, the focus has been on the big interstate pipelines and there's been two that have gotten a lot of press. The one is the Dominion pipe called Atlantic Coast Pipeline uh, that was running from, from the Marcellus down into uh, Virginia, as well as Mount Valley, which also basically paralleled it with a little more Southern route. Uh, Dominion, I, I forget the exact numbers, but um, I think they had four or 5 billion invested in that pipeline and earlier this year decided to cancel it. Uh, and that happened when Berkshire Hathaway um, took over as well, but, but they made a significant investment of time and money and never could get that project across the finish line. MVP is still trying. I believe it's 90% complete. I think they just raised the budget again to 6 billion. And I believe when I was there, we had, right when we had first moved the first dirt to start construction, um, I was still there. And I think our budget was three and a half billion at the time. So it's hasn't quite doubled, but it's nearly doubled. And there's still, some uncertainty about whether it ultimately gets completed. And I would say with, under the new administration, if, if MVP couldn't get across the goal line under Trump administration, uh, I'm seriously concerned whether it can get finished uh, under a Biden administration, even though they're 90% done. So I think uh, the fourth circuit again, stalled construction just a couple of weeks ago. So again, their shovels are down um, still waiting to get uh, permits and, and court approvals to, to finish the job. So it's, it's tough sledding in the, in the long haul pipeline business. And I think on the, on the gathering side, that's going to that's gonna go up and down along with the EMP. So the, when EMP is healthy and growing, again, I think though at more moderate rates, then the gathering businesses will be growing at moderate rates. Um, and, and those are typically state controlled pipelines. So it's a little easier to get those constructed. It's, uh, it was very sad to see Williams uh, uh, stop their efforts on that one that you mentioned. Um, and I, I keep a pretty good track of what's going on in the anti oil and gas, uh, anti petrochemical space. And uh, I can tell you that all those people were just really crowing uh, when Williams threw the towel in um, and basically saying, you know, we, we won, not by getting it canceled, but by wearing people down for so long that it got to the point that it no longer made economic sense. And that's their strategy. 
uh, whenever they can implement that type of strategy on whatever project it is. They, they know they can't get that cancellation or whatever by law or whatever. So they just <laughs> take that long view. And unfortunately, it's much more effective than, than uh, we would like. So exactly. um, anyway, OK. So uh, I wanted to discuss the uh, oil field service uh, space for a little bit. This is an area where, where Stone Piers has done a number of deals. And um, because the sizes range all over the lot, you can have um, uh, lower middle market, middle market, all the way up through obviously multi-billion dollar companies. And, uh, uh, and then in addition to doing deals in that space, we do advisory work for a number of those companies. So we, so we keep in touch with, with many of them. Um, and a, a lot of people were really afraid in this current downturn that, that we would see an, just a flood of bankruptcies in oil field services uh, in this region. Um, and we really have it. Um, and the only people that might dis disappoint are, are some of the, uh, our friends in the, in the turnaround uh, uh, space, uh, bankruptcy related space. Uh, but it's been, it's been gratifying to see um, the, the comp all the companies that, that we work with have clearly gone through some difficult times. Uh, their revenues are, are down significantly in, in almost all cases. And, uh, and they all had significant fears. Um, the, the PPP loan situation helped out a lot uh, for these companies. It was a real lifesaver in many ways. And uh, what they've been doing while things were slower is figuring out um, how to be more efficient. Uh, of course, they do that in every downturn, but this, this time even more so. Uh, how to implement more innovation uh, that, that's going to, to drive value. And, and I, I've been shocked. I did a check uh, on performance of many of these companies just over the last week. And all the ones I checked with that we advise all have positive EBITDA at this point in time. Um, and some of them pretty healthy numbers, uh, shockingly, actually. Uh, so, so that's been very gratifying. Uh, a little more detail on what they're doing. Um, we're taking the, the time to really improve the technology um, and, and make sure that their uh, E&P clients uh, buy in to what they're doing. Otherwise, they don't spend the time or money uh, figuring it out. Um, uh, all CapEx is geared towards innovation and efficiency improvements. Uh, that they, most, they generally feel that's the best, best use of CapEx dollars in a, in a weak market. Um, even the smaller ones are looking to go beyond uh, the Marcellus Utica and, and uh, do work in other uh, basins. And several of them are uh, looking at and actually involved in international activities, especially where um, uh, they can negotiate a situation where they don't have any risk. Um, on the pricing front, uh, these companies have generally, um, after lowering their prices to some degree because of the situation, then they just put their foot down and say, you want us around? You want us to do this quality work for you uh, consistently in the future? We've got to maintain our, our day rate. At, at, at a certain level. Um, and that's been successful um, in most cases. Uh, they're working hard on, on capturing the value from new technology. They're not afraid to shrink. They're divesting non-core assets or um, non-core uh, product uh, service lines, business services. Um, of course, they're you know being incredibly careful about cash flow and paying down debt um, and always assessing ways to reduce costs. Uh, so that whole uh, group of activities has been very effective, surprisingly so in, in some cases. And I'm, they're optimistic uh, at this point in time. 
Um, and they're, you know, they're a, that's a tough group because, you know, the EMP companies, they, they use these, these uh, service companies and turn them on and off with a switch in most cases, uh, some exceptions, but they can turn them on and off with a switch. And um, uh, so the, the fact that these, these people are doing as well as they are in this downturn is, is fantastic. Um, Steve, you, you got, got any thoughts about that? No, I'm, I'm, you updated me earlier today on some of those EBITDA numbers. So that was refreshing to hear that, that, uh, that, that many of them are, are doing well. I get my general feel though is that if, if you were gonna go under, you would have by now for most of these companies. Cause I think, I think we're through the worst of it. Um, we're seeing rig counts slowly come back. Uh, if I had to say where I think rig counts will settle out, so we went from well, we went from well north of 100 way back, but 75 I think in the Northeast earlier this year to I think I said 31, um, and we might be up a, a couple of ticks from that. You know, I kind of think the sweet spot's somewhere around 50. So you know, that's a healthy 50, 60 percent improvement from where we're at today going forward. So I think uh, the ones that have made it through and are, are generating uh, positive returns now, the future looks pretty bright. Um, so I think that's that was good to hear that uh, you didn't find more distress than you did. One of the things that, that's been uh, happening to some degree on, on the oil field service side, um, similar to what's happened on, on the E&P side, you know, uh, we, we started here in, in the Marcellus and Utica with tremendous interest from companies that you would consider super majors, right? So we had uh, Shell um, made an early entrance with a big splash um, with an acquisition. Um, Chevron followed that. Um, BP took a, took a run at some activity in Trumbull County in Ohio. Um, and all of those are gone. <laughs> all those companies, all those super majors are gone. They've made the decision that the Marcellus Utica doesn't work for them. And that's provided opportunities to some degree for, for uh, other companies to, to grow and, and, and uh, become significant players. So now you've got EQT is, is uh, the largest, not only here in, in, in our region, but, but nationally. Uh, and then you've got Antero and Southwestern now after the Southwestern um, uh, at recent acquisition as uh, number one, number two, and number three. Um, if you go back to when Chevron bought Atlas, Bruce Niemeyer, who was the first president of Chevron Appalachia, told me very confidently when we were sitting at um, a Cubs game, he was a Cubs fan, um, at PNC Park, he looked up at the skyline, he said, a couple of years, you'll see she the word Chevron on the top of one of those buildings. Obviously that didn't happen. Um, and, and so similarly on the, on the, um, uh, on the oil field services side, the largest oil field services company in the world, Schlumberger, uh, left the basin in 2016-17 and, and now has completely left fracking worldwide, as I understand it. Um, so maybe, maybe there are going to be opportunities with all these big companies uh, all over the lot leaving for uh, middle market companies. Thoughts? Yeah, I think so. I think you're, I mean, you gave a great example of Schlumberger when they, you know, they, I didn't know if, I didn't know if, I don't know if they're out of fracking worldwide. They may be, but they clearly uh, are out of it in the U.S. with the exception of a, you know, a minority ownership interest in the, in the company that they turned it over to, but they're at, they're not actively involved in fracking in the U.S. So that's, okay. that's pretty dramatic when Schlumberger uh, packs up and, and, and leaves. Um, but there's going to be, I believe there's going to be fracking in the U.S. for some time to come. 
because I think it's it'd be very difficult even for a Biden and Harris administration to ban it other than on federal land. So I don't think fracking is going away. And, it, and like I said, I actually think it'll rebound from here a bit, not to, not to what we saw in the past, but, but there is upside from here. So I think that presents opportunities for small independent middle market companies um, to come in, acquire the assets from, from, from those bigger folks, probably for cheap um, and you know, reset their, their cost basis lower and, and, and set up a pro nice profitable business. I think yeah. that's very likely. Yeah, that happened in a number of industries, and this is no exception. Um, well, I'm going to move on to uh, uh, petrochemical and gas storage, unless uh, somebody else wants to jump in with questions or make further comments. Um, as you all know, um, probably the largest construction project in the United States, I'm told, uh, is going on in Beaver County. Uh, at the Shell Petrochemical Complex. Um, they, they got up to over 8,000 employees on site. Uh, Pre-COVID, uh, had some issues, dropped way down. They've been building it back up. They're now back over 7,000. And that, and that project continues. It's over 70% uh, complete. And so sometime in the next year, year and a half, uh, we should see, um, we should see that that project go uh, online, be fully operational. Um, that's a great development for for our region in every way, and all the various companies that supply uh, that incredible ten. It's really a ten billion dollar uh, facility. It's what it takes. Um, those all those companies. Those are. Um, that service uh, Shell in so many different ways are all uh, prospects for, for most of you who are listening on this, whether, like I said, whether it's M&A or legal or accounting or other uh, professional services. Um, and and, it, and it's, it's, a, it's a great situation. Now we've all been waiting for the PTT Global Chemical Project down at uh, in Dilly's Bottom, Ohio on the river. And this project is also a, a $10 billion project. And it's also taken a very, very long time, just as the Shell project did. But unfortunately, PTT is not Shell. And, and while they are a multi-billion dollar company, they're, they're not you know, uh, Shell, which is what, second largest in the world or whatever. Um, so that project continued to get delayed and now that we've gone into this COVID situation, and so there are various uncertainties, uh, for the first time, a number of people are getting really nervous about PTT being able to put this together. They lost their major um, uh, partner, uh, Day Lim, which is out of uh, Korea. Frankly, they just didn't get along with each other, and that was bound to happen from everything I observed. Um, and PTT has been, they've announced and said many times that they're uh, in negotiations with other potential partners. Um, at a recent, like 10 days ago, uh, conference, um, the a PTT representative made it really clear that they're not doing very well on getting a new partner because he said, of the four, just about 40 or so people in the conference, he said, and by the way, if you happen to know anybody who would like to partner with us, give me a call. So you, this is, he's saying to a group, a small group of people, if you happen to know anybody who's got billions of dollars that they would like to spend partnering with us, I, I, it, it was just, everybody kind of looked at each other in, in a little shock and awe made because it made it so clear that, that they don't have a partner. So why is all this important? Well, the, the impact that this kind of $10 billion project has is really just unbelievable as we've seen with the Shell project. It's not all that far from Pittsburgh to where the PTT site is. And, um, uh, and there's all sorts of other things that are pending. So 
so PTT just as Shell did. Shell negotiated all kinds of contracts long before they made their final investment decision. PTT's done the same thing. They've negotiated a supply of ethane from range, and they're going to do that with many others. Shell has 10 contracts uh, for the supply of ethane to their facility. Uh, but, but range is, is going to be the dominant one for the PTT facility. Um, they've entered into a, a contingent contract with Mountaineer uh, NGL storage for storage of the ethane, which is the, um, the, the feedstock for uh, these types of petrochemical plants. Uh, and that's a great thing. But the whole project is up in the air. There's been talk about somebody major like ExxonMobil coming in and just buying the whole thing from PTT and not partnering, just taking it over. I frankly think, but for COVID that would have happened already, um, but it hasn't. Um, and and, and, and if, for the first time, I'm, I'm, I'm really concerned uh, that, that uh, uh, this could get derailed. It really wasn't until just a re recent weeks. Um, the gas storage situation is, depending on who you talk to, could go a couple different ways. Uh, there are a lot of people who are afraid, are afraid that um, the Biden administration will provide no support for increasing storage of any kind of fossil fuel going forward, just as people are afraid they'll, they'll take away the um, intangible drilling cost uh, deduction. Um, on the producers. And most of these gas storage projects are significant, sufficiently large, they require some kind of federal government involvement. Um, so that's, that's the possibility that that, that's a, that could be a real problem. On the other hand, there are some people who think that there's enough activity going on with respect to smaller uh, gas storage projects that that this will work out. So so Marathon Oil in, in Cadiz, Ohio. I'm, if I'm pronouncing Cadiz wrong, I apologize. Um, Marathon is going forward with a storage project of their own, and they're not um, they're not seeking uh, federal funding. So that's a really good sign. Um, and and if if these projects can be done on a smaller basis and collectively get get larger as as petrochemical plants get built out here uh and of course there's a big if on that too then uh you know maybe that can work in terms of the future of petrochemical plants you've probably all been hearing that uh, depending on the source anywhere from four to seven petrochemical plants could be built in this region and supported by the natural gas industry um, uh, the one, one of the best analysts of this is a guy named Tom Gelrich from Topline Analytics. He, he really he does a lot of consulting for the major companies and he just he, he makes it all seem quite simple and he always comes up with observations that no one else seems to have. Um, he, he's concerned about uh, the PP, PTT project uh, as well. But, um, but things, it, as soon as things kind of stabilize a little bit, there's a huge increase in demand for PPE products, which are almost all made from um, plastics um, as a result of ethylene through these, through these petrochemical plants. And pricing dipped down originally when COVID hit and the, everything froze and the pricing has now going way back up. And so that's a good thing. He, his analysis is that this market will be good long-term for multiple, multiple petrochemical plants in this region, at least, at least a total of four. The numbers that he shows for the advantages of being located here in terms of the pricing, of the ethane, but also the transportation costs to the plastics manufacturers that are largely located, 
located up in our part of the world. Those numbers are so compelling. He has stated that when Shell finishes their plant, he is absolutely certain they'll very shortly thereafter announce uh, a, um, a project to dramatically increase production. It's a pretty strong statement and he's, he's not a fool. So, so that's a good thing um, for sure. So, so relatively sh short to medium term, if he's right, we'll have a, an increase uh, in the shell uh, plant and uh, longer term, despite this mess with, with PTT and their partners uh, will still be okay there. So uh, that's, that's what I wanted to get into. Uh, we've got about 10 minutes left for, for questions. Uh, do we have questions for anybody? No questions. We can talk a little bit about other, um, other elements of energy in, in the region. Um, anybody want to do anything different? Questions? Anybody there? <laughs> okay. All right. Well, one of the areas that uh, I think we all uh, have had um, a lot of concern about is uh, the, the, the nuclear related um, space where, you know, Westinghouse, the 800 pound gorilla um, expanded like wild before Fukushima, Fukushima uh, brought in thousands of people, highly paid, built that million square foot plus headquarters um, uh, out in Cranberry and and then everything kind of uh, went south uh, for the industry and they had made on top of that a horrible acquisition that that just you know put pushed them in, into bankruptcy um, but you know that that industry is coming back there's new technology that is gaining a lot of traction the Democratic Party and in, in the in their platform um, Biden's platform for the first time included nuclear energy, first time since 1972, uh, which was amazing. I, I never thought I'd, I'd see that. And in terms of um, whether it's Westinghouse people or all sorts of other companies that are out there, um, the, the work available in decommissioning plants uh, is, is, is huge. It takes 20 years to decommission a nuclear plant and there's so much that needs to be done. So there's a lot of activity uh, in that space. Uh, at Stone Pier, we have one client in the nuclear services space. So we do try to follow it a little bit uh, more than we otherwise would. Um, I'm, I, although that was a big hit for our region to have Westinghouse go bankrupt, I think, I think that there are so many people here who are knowledgeable in that space. As the decommissioning expands, as the new technology expands, um, I, I think we're gonna do well in this region from, from the nuclear side. Um, we can talk about renewables. Um, you know, m many of you know, I'm chairman of something called the Energy Innovation Center uh, Institute. Uh, Steve uh, is also on the board there and we're both on the executive committee. Uh, we do see uh, a number of uh, uh, different things through the Energy Innovation Center Institute activities. Um, at the Energy Innovation Center, we've got um, uh, wind, uh, we've got solar, We've got um, mostly uh, gas turbine, gas turbines uh, by Capstone in the basement, generating a, a combined heat and power from Marcellus and Utica natural gas, which we're very proud about. Um, and we're uh, looking to put in a hydrogen fuel cell. So we're what we like to call ourselves an all of the above energy uh, institute. And so we do get exposure to a lot of those things. I would say that in energy technology, um, all of you interested in M&A should be very focused on 
what's happening in Pittsburgh with energy technology companies. They are um, small but growing and have huge applications and an impact. Um, and uh, if you ever want to get a little more conversant with some of those things going on, you can you can get get in touch with us at, at the institute, and we'll uh, uh, we'll we'll get you up to speed. Hey, hey Trent and Steve, I, I think we have a question from Peter. Uh, okay. And his question, first he thanks you both for your insights. And his question was, do you think there will be further impairments of oil and gas properties this year or have previous impairments in the prior year captured the extent of the decrease in value of those properties? Good question. Steve, I'll let you take that one. Yeah. That's your area. So I, I obviously don't know the, the answer to that, but my opinion would be, Given where gas prices are today, and where and I I'm moderately bullish uh, for prices through the end of the year. Uh, any impairments that were necessary based on the lower prices should have been taken already, and when they get to their year-end reserve reports and use the SEC pricing. Uh, it's hard to, I haven't looked back and see what that average, because the SEC makes you use an average, um, what that will look like. But I think going forward, prices will look better. I, I tend to think there might be still a little bit left to go, but but I, I wouldn't expect any massive additional impairments. Those really should have been taken already. And companies that, that, that are doing it correctly should have already written those assets down. Okay. There seems to be a little fudging in that area sometimes as to whether or not a company decides to sell or decides to keep keep their assets. Steve, do you see that? Uh, on impairments? Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, companies, uh, I always found it a little interesting and they hate to do it because it looks bad on that quarterly earnings report. But my experience always was investors look past impairments very quickly. And the ability to reset your ongoing DDNA, to me, always outweighed any reluctance to take the impairments that you needed to take. But some companies have a different view. They just despise any of those negative hits uh, to their earnings and will, you know, will get creative in finding ways not to take them. But right. I think, I think uh, it got so bad this year and last year that, that it, it was hard to get creative enough not to take the impairments you needed to take. So I think most, that's why I think most of them, they've been done. Uh, I don't think there should be much left to do. And any company that's avoided them to date will probably be able to find a way to avoid taking them uh, in the future. So I, I don't expect to see a lot more. Okay, good, good comments. Uh, any more questions? Uh, we're just about out of time at our three o'clock uh, bell tolling uh, situation. Uh, looks like there's time for one more question. No. Nope. All right. All right. In, unless there's any more questions, is this a, would this be a good time to, to wrap? I think it would. Okay. Well, thanks very much, Steve and Charlie. I think we're I feel pretty lucky having listened to that and, and, and having experts on hand in such an important uh, industry for this region. And thank you all for attending today. Uh, a survey link will be emailed to you following this call and any feedback you can give is greatly appreciated. Uh, our next ACG Pittsburgh virtual event will be held on Thursday, November 19th. So that's this Thursday and is presented by the Future of Corporate Leaders Board. It will highlight uh, best practices in business development and networking from home during this current climate. We, uh, we, you know, we hope you're able to join us. We will then return to our regular programming again in January, January for our annual Economist panel update. We wish you a wonderful and safe holiday season and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.